Welcome back into the BI into our class BI 250, the, the book of Job. BI 250, the book of Job, and this is the Tommy teaching series. And we're going through the book of Job now, and we spent a significant amount of time in our last in our last hour discussing the introduction, the basics, overall structure, and introduction to the book of Job. Job is a very significant, very applicable, very up-to-date book. Every single one of us, and we're living on this earth, man, will experience trials and tribulations and adversity and difficulties and sickness, and, and we will receive attacks, all kinds of issues. And that, this is among our closest friends, our relatives, our neighbors, and people that we know. All of us must continuously face adversity. And the book of Job tells us exactly how to respond and what are the biblical principles behind the response that we should be giving, not the reaction. There's a profound difference between the response and the reaction. And so what we want to do is we want to end, we now we're going to go back into the text in Job chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And, we, and remember, this is Job's way of life. And then all of a sudden, it is interrupted by satanic attacks and all kinds of horrible suffering. All of us have suffered something or another. Some of us have suffered more than others and so forth. But nevertheless, we have principles by which we have to live our lives by. So let's go back into the text in Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And don't forget, I'm reading out the New American Standard Version of the Bible, the NASB Version. So depending on what version you have or language version, okay, that's okay. Just follow along with me and let's get into the text. Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless. Hmm? He says, an upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very, and very many servants. And, um, and that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send word and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send word to them and consecrate them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, and Job did so continuously. Now, we left off yesterday in our last in our last hour talking about specifically it, it, where is this place ooze where is it because it says that it, he says that that Job okay was Job was, was a man in the land of ooze okay and that's what we want to look at it here now where the precise location of ooze is un, uh, is unknown but we know that the area known as ooze is also mentioned uh, in other places in the Bible okay so I just want to focus in on that because. Uh, there's a lot of people who get it confused, you know. They can they get they get the issue of who's confused with the land of Oz, okay? And this is not Kansas, all right? So I want to talk to you about this about this location, Ooz, because it has a significance. Right? And you know, you remember we left off with Jeremiah in chapter five. Then you know, sorry, Jeremiah chapter twenty-five, verse twenty says this. It says this, and to all the foreign people, all the kings of the land of Ooz. All the kings of the land of the Philistines, that is Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. Okay? So we know that this is a real place okay? because the prophet Jeremiah talked about it. Well, the book of Lamentations also mentions the land of Uz, and that is in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21. He says, Rejoice and be joyful, the daughter of Edom, who lives in the land of Uz. But the cup will pass to you as well as you will become drunk and expose yourself. Now, Uz is also the name of an Edomite man that we know of, okay? And one of the three sons of Dishon mentioned in the books of Genesis and the First Chronicles. So we know we know that this is. So this son, now, this is pure speculation at this point, but this son might, this son might have been given, might have given his name to the land of Uz. Now, regardless of the origin of the name, scholars have speculated on its location. Well, in the book of Genesis, chapter 36, verse 28, it says, These are the sons of Dishon, Uz and Aran. Right? Well, in 1 Chronicles, chapter 1, verse 42, it says, The sons of Ezra were, Bi were, were Bihan, Sa Sa'avan, and Ja'akan, and the sons of Dishon were Uz and Aran. So among the possibilities are the following. It's, the land of Uz is either in or near Bashan, which would be south of Damascus, 
or it's in or near Edom, which would be southeast of the Dead Sea, or it's in northern Arabia, east of Edom. Okay, so scholars have pointed to the northern uh, to the northern Saudi Arabia note, an area called what they call the what they call the the Wadi Suhan, the Wadi Suhan. Okay. Now, this is roughly about a 200-mile valley that is fertile, enough to have supported the large herds that the, the, the large herds that Job possessed. And so, there's a lot of there's a lot of speculation to this that this might have been the place. It is also near a desert, okay, and we see that, okay, and close enough to Edom to be associated with it. In addition, it was within a it was within what we would call the raiding distance, the raiding distance, okay, of the Chaldeans who attacked Job's camels. Now go go to Job chapter one verse nineteen, um, and now now why are we spending time what we're spending time on this is because there's a there's a, there people always want to discount something in the Bible just simply because they don't have a, happen to have the information immediately at hand. But I want you to see this, that the Bible has no contradictions, neither, neither are we left to speculate on our own, but we're given a lot of good information, okay, so that we can kind of discern more or less where the land of Uz might have been to prove that Uz did exist. Now, if Uz existed, then, then now we work on the person of Job and his existence. In the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 19, it says this, and behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck to the four corners of the house, and it fell down on the young people, and they died, and alone, and, and, and I alone have escaped the fate. Remember when that messenger came to tell Job that? Well, and he said, so we know that we know from meteorological reports, okay, that this happens in this particular area often. Well, go two verses up in Job chapter 1, verse 17. In Job 1, 17, it says, while he was still speaking, another came, I remember another one of his servants, messengers came, the Chaldeans formed three units and made a raid on the camels and took them and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I don't have escaped to tell you. So we know that the Chaldeans was close enough at that period in time, okay, to be, to, for this to be the location. Now, I did, that, that was just a side note, just to kind of just establish okay, some parameters here. Now, Job's character, however, is far far more important than where he lived, okay? Thus, immediately after identifying the man from Uz as Job, the writer lists two vital facts about his character. And that's what we want to focus on, okay? First of all, Job was a blameless and perfect and upright. Um, I don't know anybody who's blameless, perfect, and upright, okay? And when I look in the mirror, I don't see him either, okay? But I want to focus in on what, what, what does the Bible say when you're blameless, upright, and, okay, and just? What, 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 and perfect. What does that mean? Well, look at that. Go back to Job chapter 1, verse 1. In Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. And depending on what version of the Bible that you may have, it says he is perfect. Okay? And I think that it's essential to understand how these two words are used here. Now, the word blameless, okay, um, in the NASB version is what, what the King James Version would say, he is perfect. Okay? It does not mean sinless. Okay? So I want to make sure we understand this. Okay? It does not mean sinless. Job was a human being. We agree on that. Therefore, he could not have been sinless. That's an act of impossibility. Nor was he perfect in the sense that the word is used today. We use the word perfect, okay, without any flaw. Okay, That's how we use the word perfect today. But that's not the word that is being used here, especially in the King James Version. Now, the Hebrew word blameless, okay, or the word perfect, okay, in the Hebrew word is tam, okay, tam in the Hebrew language. And he refers to being, it refers to being blameless on the outside, outward. Um, it means that he is blameless uh, to willful sin. Okay? He, he, it, it's, it's not to sinless perfection. But you, he's obviously not in a state of sin. He's not uh, willfully sinning. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what this, this word means here. And, and what it's suggesting is that Job, okay, was innocent of deliberate and conscious, and conscious sin. Okay? That's what he. Be, that's what he is. Okay, he's innocent of of conscious and and deliberate sin, and that he was a man of integrity who walked closely with the word with the Lord. So, as described here in in chapter thirty one of the book of Job, 
Job was a moral man. Job was um, a just man. Job was an honest man. Job was loyal to his wife and his family. Job was generous to the poor. Job was faithful to the Lord. Okay, That really is the description of a blameless man. Okay, Not a sinless man, but a blameless man. Okay, Now, the other thing is that you have to understand about Job is that Job did not worship false gods or idols, okay? But rather the only true and living God. That's who he was worshiping. And for this reason, he sought to do what? Job sought to please and honor the Lord in all that he did, okay? And his heart was pure. Consequently, he was right. He was in, he was what we would call in right standing before the Lord. Now the question is, is that how you find yourself? So before you begin to complain, and before we get caught up into the belly aching about life is not fair, okay? This shouldn't have never happened to me, and so forth and so forth, okay? I think that the standard, okay, of comparison, and please, whatever you do, stop comparing yourself with other people. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't compare yourself with other people. Compare yourself with the scriptures, with the scriptures, okay? That's the best thing that you can do. Look, uh, I have a very dear and precious friend, a very dear and precious brother in Christ Jesus, okay? And everybody knows who that is, okay, who knows me personally. That'd be Gary Fleetwood, okay, Dr. Gary Fleetwood. Mm -hmm. And I've always said that he's much more noble than I am, okay, uh, in, in my opinion and so forth, okay. Um, he has attributes, okay, that I, 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 daily, I, I, that I, that I treasure in, in his life, okay, and who he is, okay. But I can't compare myself to him. I have to compare myself to the scriptures, to the scriptures, okay. That's what I have to do. And so when we, when we begin to unpack the book of Job and see all of the, un, so what we would call the unjust things happen to him, I have to consider, okay, I don't even come to the shoelaces of Job, okay? Neither Job nor God ever claimed that Job was sinless. That, and I've heard people say this, and I go, that, the Bible never said that, okay? Only that it only says that he was blameless, innocent of. In other words, he was innocent of known sin, innocent of known sin, and that's really crucial to keep in mind. Okay, if Job were perfect or sinless, okay, he would not have needed to repent as he did in the closing chapter of the book of Job. You know, because it does. You know, people say, "Well, you know, he was a perfect blameless man." I go, "Yeah." Uh, well, he was perfect. No, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? Because if he was so perfect, why did he have to repent? Uh, in fact, let me show you this. Go to Job chapter 42, verse 6. And in Job chapter 42, verse 6, let's look it up. Look what he says. He says, and Job says this, Therefore I retract and I repent, sitting on dust and ashes. A perfect sinless man would not need to repent. So obviously, it doesn't mean, okay, sinless. Now go back to Job chapter 1, verse 1. He says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Well, now let's look at the second word about a description of Job's character. It says that he was upright, okay? In the Hebrew tongue, it's the word yasah, yasah, okay? And, and it points to Job's integrity. That's what it's talking about, Job's integrity, okay? Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 6. Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 6, and look what he says. Righteous guards the one righteousness. He says righteousness guards the one the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness brings the sinner to ruin. L listen to it carefully. Righteousness guards the one who the one whose way is blameless. He was a morally straight and lived according to his belief, his and his convictions. Now I realize that today I sound antiquated. In fact. I get a lot of text messages and emails and so forth. People, you know, you say, you sound so antiquated, so old, so, so, you know, from yesteryear. Because I am, okay? And not because I'm trying to sound like it, it's I am, you know? And I, and I realize that. I got, I got, I got, I'm, I'm not offended by that in, in any manner, whatsoever, you know? Uh, it doesn't bother me at all. Not, not at all. See, I recognize that seven decades have moved on. I, I get that. I understand that. But that's those are the those are the, the it's the language and it's the it's the cultural pattern by which I was raised in. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I know that he was a morally straight man and lived according to his beliefs and his convictions. Okay? Now, I was raised that that's what we were supposed to do. Now, I didn't always do that. Okay? In other words, a person who observed jo who, who can observe, observe Job's behavior in his day-to-day -day life would find no fault in him, neither did God. That's the point. Go back to Job chapter 1 and look at verse 8. Job chapter 1 verse 8. Now, we're taking the time to specifically look at his character, his person. Because I, I you know, I, and as a pastor, I hear people, well, it's not right, it's not fair, you know, it's not, it, it, this isn't just, this shouldn't have happened to me, blah, blah, blah. And, and, I, and I understand what they're trying to say to me, okay? And I got to sit there and look at, well, are you a blameless person, upright, moral, straight, without any known sin? And most time, let me be frank with you, most time that's not true in, in a person's life. Now, there are people like that. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Okay? Look what he says in Job chapter 1, verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Wow. For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Can God say that about you? I mean, can God say, hmm, Have you considered my servant Eddie Ildefonso? For there's no one like him on the earth, a blameless every man, fearing God and turning away. I don't think I, I don't think God will ever say that about me. Okay? I, I, I don't come up to the shoelaces of Job. I, I get that, okay? But I want you to see somebody who is at the pinnacle, at the height of integrity, can still be attacked by Satan. What can you and I expect? Now, just for a moment with me. Just for a moment. Imagine God introduces you to Satan. <laughs> That's what he did, right? In verse 8. And he says, have you considered my servant Eddie? He's setting, it up, he's setting him up to be attacked in his sovereign will, giving Satan a perm permission to focus in, zero in on The second thing that you note about Job is that Job feared God. He feared God, okay? And shunned, he was eschewing evil, he was shunning evil, he was running from evil. And scripture declares that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Turn your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, look at this. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now, I'm not talking about the fear where you're terrified. Okay? You're, 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 you're scared witless, you know. It, it, that's not, it, it, it's this profound, awesome respect for who God is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That's Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Well, let me show you this. Turn your Bible to Psalm 111. Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who follow his commandments have a good understanding, and his praise endures forever. Now, this phrase, the fear of the Lord, okay, it means much more than, than I would just say, than fright, than fright, okay? Or, 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 or the feeling of fear. You're frightened. You're feeling of fear. It means much more than that. It's, it, it's just a, this is a very broad word, okay? That's like an umbrella, okay? It includes, it includes the biblical concept of reverence. Reverence, okay? It, it includes the concept of awe, to be in awe in the presence of Almighty God. It's an acknowledgement of God's perfection. It's an acknowledgement of God's strength. It's an acknowledgement uh, uh, of, uh, of God's majesty in contrast to human weakness, sinfulness, and need. Okay? So that's what it means, the fear of the Lord. Okay? Now, there is what we would call an appropriate fear. There is an appropriate fear of the Lord that leads to a godly lifestyle and righteous behavior. And what we understand is that, is that Job avoided he shunned evil, or as the King James Version, he eschewed evil. I kind of like the, the old King James, because that's how I cut my teeth on, on scriptures, okay, in King James, originally. 
And I, in fact, for 18 years, I preached um, out of uh, the King James Version of the Bible. And then for the last 22 years uh, or so, or a little more than that, I've been preaching out of the NASB Version of the Bible. But look, I just love what he said. And he eschewed evil, okay? He shunned evil, okay? Why? Because he feared and revered the Lord. That's why, okay? And because he feared and revered the Lord, he sought to live a blameless and upright life. So my question is, is that where you're living? Is that where you are? And if not, then you need to really look at the life of Job, okay? Now, set aside for the moment. We're going to get into the details of why he was attacked, okay? But, but can you honestly say, can somebody look at you when they hear your name? When your name is spoken, okay? When your name is spoken, can they say, that man fears the Lord. He reverence the Lord. He seeks to please the Lord. Can they say that about you, honestly? Now, God blessed Job. That is very clear in the scriptures, okay? And he blessed him with a very large family. He has seven sons and three daughters, okay? You know? and, and let me tell you that. Now, 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 I want to also a side note here. Not to, you know, not too much should be made of these numbers, okay? That he had ten children, okay? Even though scholars point uh, out that they have symbolic meaning, including the sum of ten and so forth and so forth and so forth, okay? Um, that's not that's not. And I've actually I've actually heard of, of people teach and preach through Job this way, and I'm like, no, that that's not the plain. That's not the main point here. In fact, that's not the main emphasis here, okay? It's not. It's not, it's not on the size of Joe's family. Because in that day, okay, a large family was considered a sign of God's blessing and favor. Therefore, when Joe's fortunes and family were restored, you remember that? And we, we, we have to wait all the way to the end of the book of Job to see the restoration. Okay? You know, we go chapter 1 all the way to chapter 42 when we see this final restoration of Job's family. Okay, And the, and the Lord blessed him again. With seven sons and three daughters, that's that, that's just amazing to me. It's just absolutely amazing to me. Okay, so hence the closing of Job. I mean, when you think about the, about that, you know, in chapter forty-two, the closing chapter of Job, okay, will present a picture of complete restoration, of complete restoration. Okay, and God had initially blessed God, had blessed Job with it, with this. I, what, what, what they were considering in those days, the ideal family, okay? Even after Job lost everything he had, God would bless him with another. And so the Lord blessed Job with great wealth. That's true, okay? He had a huge, um, what we would call today, uh, let's call it, he had a huge ranch and a farm. He owned an enormous number of animals, and he had all kinds of servants, Okay? which was a common way to measure wealth in the ancient world. That's how you measure wealth in the ancient world, okay? So obviously, Job needed quite a bit of land in order to support such a large herd, as well as to provide food for the extensive number of workers. I mean, he had many, many workers, all kinds of servants, and to sell produce in the markets throughout the region. So he was, a, he was, a, he was the greatest man of what we know, the Bible calls him the man of the East, okay? Now, let's think about what Job had, okay? Uh, because, you know, people are always fascinated with numbers. You know? They just, they just are. People are just enamored with numbers, you know? They just like to, they, they just love it, okay? Well, Job had 7,000 sheep. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but that's a lot of sheep, man. That just is. And sheep were useful for both the food and clothing. And in the ancient East, okay, they were heavily relied on for both food and clothing. So this man was a major, he was a major producer, okay? And because Job owned so many sheep, he likely engaged in the trade and commerce, thereby increasing his wealth. So not only is he raising sheep, but he's now engaging in commerce, okay? And in trading and in wealth, okay? So as he did that, he, his wealth just kept growing and growing and growing. It was just exponential growth all the time. Now, this was all more likely in view of the fact that he owned so many camels as well, which was a major source of transportation in the desert regions of his day. Okay? So, caravans of camels served the same purpose as the trucking industry does today. Okay? 
So you can make it, you can make it, so he's involved in food, food, clothing, transportation. You can kind of see the picture of Job's mighty wealth, okay, and how God just blessed them beyond measure. Okay? Then Job had, and not that, but Job had, Job had 3,000 camels. I, mean, I don't know about you, man, but, you know, I've been with camels. I've ridden on camels, okay, and they smelt the high heaven, man, just like sheep stink, okay, and they smelt, but then the profound difference is that when a camel looks at you and he spits at you, you, you just want to die, okay, you want to die, <laughs> okay, uh, look, these were, now these camels, they were used for transportation, they were used to transport cro crops, they were used to transport other goods throughout the region, but camels were also prized for their milk and their meat, okay, so you can see, so you can see, uh, Job is involved in the dairy business, okay? Uh, camels, okay, and I remember being, being in the Middle East, okay? That camels, they, they get milk, they, you know, for, and let me tell you that it provides just all kinds of amount of milk. And when the, and then some are raised just for the purpose of killing for food, okay? For meat. Okay? So you had three thousand camels, okay? And then he. Job had a thousand oxen, a thousand oxen, okay? In other words, he had 500 yoke or pairs, 500 yoke, which is pairs, okay? So that's a thousand. He had 500. When he says it's 500, that's yoke, okay? That means 500 pairs, okay? So that's a thousand oxen, okay? And this indicates that he was engaged in farming on a very large scale because, let me say, oxen were used especially for plowing and moving heavy loads, Okay? Even for operating machinery like the, you know, remember the, the grain stone, okay, uh, and the grain mills, okay, and then, and oxen can also serve as food source as well. So, so you can be, this is just, in, in, it's unimaginable, okay, it's unimaginable, unimaginable wealth that Job has. God blessed this man mightily. I want you to see that at the height of where this man is, so you can understand how far he had fallen after being attacked by Satan. So before you get caught in the game, before you get caught up in the game of comparing yourself with Job or telling people I've had a Job experience, okay, uh, I want you to think about where, where Job was before he was attacked, okay. Furthermore, it's likely Job used them in his burnt offerings to the Lord as well. He would take his animals, right? Go back to Job chapter 1 verse 5. Job chapter 1 verse 5. What we're doing, we're just giving you a sketch of Job's background. In Job chapter 1 verse 5, when the days of the feasting had completed the cycle, Job went and sent word to them and consecrated them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of, to, according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job did so continually. Now, to do the, the burnt offerings, okay, you have to really understand how they were done, and that you can find that in the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, okay? And now, Job also had 500 donkeys. Can you imagine that? 500 donkeys. One donkey is a challenge. He had 500 of them. And the Hebrew word for donkey refers to the female donkeys only. And this is really, there's an important distinction here. Okay? The females may have been prized more than the males for what? For their milk. A delicacy during the days of Job. So now he got into the high-end dairy business, okay? Donkeys like camels may also be used for transportation. This is just, this is a massive, massive wealth that he's accumulated, okay? And then, not only that, but Job had a large number of employees or servants. We're not told how many, but we're just told that it's a large number. Now, you think about all the numbers that I just shared with you, okay? You just think about, okay, he's got 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. He's got 1,000 oxen, okay? Okay, he's got, I mean, he's got 500 donkeys, okay? That required a massive army of employees, okay? The mass land and sheer number of animals he owned would have required a huge, huge number of employees. And, and, and look, and a number probably reaching into the hundreds, including their family. It's hundreds and hundreds of employees. Okay. Now, here's what we do know. 
Job was the richest person in the East, in the ancient East of that day. That's what the Bible tells us. Now, I, I accept the fact that with, if the Bible said so, end the argument, period. Okay, I accept it, okay? He was also to, said to have the greatest of the great men in the East, okay? To have been the greatest of the great men, okay? He was, I mean, this he was the big dog, okay? He was the big cheese of that era, okay? So in the time, in the context of the word, the word great, the word great, okay, could refer to both his wealth and his wisdom. Men of the East were known for their wisdom, and Job was so wise that the other wise men came to him for counsel. Mm -hmm. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to Job chapter 29. Job chapter 29. And let's go down to verse, uh, give me a moment here. Uh, I'm turning my pages here. Job chapter 29. Go down to verse 21. Job chapter 29, verse 21. And look at this in verses 21 down to verse 24. Job 29, verses 21 and 24 says, To me they listened and waited, and they kept silent for my advice. After my words, they did not speak again, and my speech dropped on them. They waited for me as for the rain, and opened their mouths as for the late rain. I smiled at them when they did not believe, and they did not look at my kindness ungraciously. Okay? Unquestionably, Job was recognized widely as a wealthy and a great man. Notable, look, listen, he, he was a noble or aristocrat of that day, okay? A man highly respected in his day. Even more impressive, okay, than his wealth was his faith in the Lord. And that's what I want to drive at, okay? Job gave credit to the Lord for all he owned. He never said, look what I've done. I did this. He never said any of that. He acknowledged that the hand of God had provided for everything in his life. Okay? And this is clearly seen in the statement he made after losing everything, including the property and his children. Go back to Job chapter 1. And look at what he says in verse uh, 21. Job chapter 1, verse 21. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's an incredible statement to make after he just realizes he lost everything. Do you know that in four decades of ministry, I have never, ever heard a person say to me after they've lost, okay, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord taken away. I, I've never heard that. And I'm talking about the most devout families uh, in Christianity today who have had to bury their loved ones, okay, or minister them after great loss. I just never heard them say that, okay. This is a perfect, and look at, look, at, look at the great departure of perspective on life that Job had compared to everybody else. Let me ask you something. If you lost your if you lost your farm, you lost your property, you lost your ranch, you lost your big home that you personally built, you lost all your machinery, everything, and you lose your wife and your children, okay? Can you honestly stand there and say, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. And the Lord gave and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you actually say that? I don't I've never met anybody who said that to me or made it out loud. Now, I'm sure that they are they're out there. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? And I want you to understand that, that the Scripture paints, a, a, how would I say, it, it just, Scripture paints a very appealing, a very appealing portrait of Job. That of a very fine, upstanding, trustworthy man. And so I want to really focus in on his character, okay? Job was blameless. As the King James says, he was a perfect man, okay? He was upright. Go back to Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and, and that man was blameless, perfect, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Hmm? You know, the second thing I want you to see about him is that Job feared God. I, I mean, I want to hammer this home into our hearts. Job feared God. Look at him, Job 1, 1, 1. He says, Job chapter 1, verse 1, he says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and the man was blameless, all right, fearing God. This is a man who feared God. The other thing that was unique about Job is that Job shared with the poor. Job shared with the poor. 
This isn't a greedy man. This is a very generous man. Let me show you this. Go to Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31. Remember, we're focusing in on his character. Who is Job? Do you measure up? Do you and I measure up to the standard of Job's integrity? Do you and I measure up to the standard of Job's walk? Do you and I measure up to the standard of how Job looked at God, how he feared God? Can you, do you and I measure up to being blameless like Job? Go to Job chapter 31, verse 16 to 21. He shared with the poor. Look at this. In verse 16, if I have kept the poor from their desire, or have caused their eyes of the widow to fail, or, or he says, if I have, no, or have, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the orphan has not shared it, but from my youth he grew up with me as with a father, and from my infancy I guided her. If I had seen more, he look what he says. If I had seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy had no covering, if his waist has not thanked me, and if he has not been warm with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the orphan because I saw I had support in the gate, no, he did quite the opposite. He provided for the poor. Not only that, but Job cared for strangers. Job cared for strangers. I, I, I want you to think about this for a moment with me, because, you know, a lot of people in church, oh, you can get into church and say, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord. And you and you, I mean, you get lost in, in the euphoria of corporate worship and blah, 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 blah. But a stranger walks in and you don't even say hello. And you're in the house of the Lord. You should be ashamed of yourself. Job cared for strangers, something that many of us do not do today, period. Look at this, Job chapter 31, verse 32. Job chapter 31, verse 32. The stranger has not spent the night outside. The stranger has not spent the night outside. For I have opened my doors to the traveler. How many times have you done that? The other thing about Job is that Job was an honest and a just judge. He was an honest and a just judge. Are you an honest judge? Turn your Bibles to Job chapter 29, look at verse 7. Job chapter 29, verse 7 says, When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the public square. You know what he's talking about? That is where, where that is exactly where all the judging took place. That's where court was held. That's where disputes were settled. Okay, that's what this is talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, stay with me there in, in Job chapter 29. Drop down to, um, let's see, um, uh, go down to verse 12. Uh, Job chapter 29, verse 12. Look at this. He says, Because I have saved the poor who cried for help and the orphan who had no helper, the blessing of the one who was about to perish came upon me, and I made the widow's heart sing for joy. Go down to verse 14. I put on righteousness and, and it clothed me, and my justice was like a robe and a headband. Look at verse 15. I was eyes to those who were blind and feet to those who could not walk. Verse 16. I was a father to the poor and I investigated the case which I did not know. Look at verse 17. I broke the jaws of the wicked and rescued the prey from his teeth. Mm -hmm. This was the character of Job. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I said, look, we cannot compare ourselves, okay, with other people. We have to compare ourselves to the scripture. Am I, am I, am, am I coming close to the description of what a righteous man should be in the scriptures? The other thing is that Job was an honest and a fair employer. He was an honest and a fair employer. Let me tell you, I know a lot of Christian employers, okay, and you should be embarrassed the way you treat your employees. You're always looking to cut corners, okay, and maximize your profits. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're not, you're not different from the, you're no different from the worldly, happy pagan employers that are out there. But Job was an honest and a fair employer as well. Turn your Bibles, Job chapter thirty-one, Job chapter thirty-one, and look at this. Let's look it down. Let's go two chapters over, and go to verse thirteen. Yes, 
Look at Job chapter 31, 31, verse 13. He says, If I have rejected the claim of my male or female slaves when they filed a complaint against me, if I have rejected the claim of my male or female slaves when, when they filed a complaint against me, what then could I do when God arises? And when he calls me to account, how am I to answer him? Verse 15, did he not, did, did he, did he who made me in the womb not make him and the same one create us in the womb? Job was, he understood that he had to treat people the way he was to be treated. Uh, stay with me there in Job chapter 31. Now go, turn the page and go down to verse 38. Look at Job chapter 31 verse 38 and look at this. He says, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together. Look at, in fact, look at the next verse, verse 39. If I have eaten his fruit without money or have caused his owners to lose their lives. Now Job is saying, have I done that? No. The other thing is that Job was highly esteemed. He was sought out for his counsel. People were looking for him for his counsel. I mean, if you are a man or a woman who's truly endowed by the Spirit of the living God, okay, washed in the blood of the Savior, okay, and, and you have been, and your mind is dominated and saturated with the Word of God, people will seek out to talk to you because your wisdom becomes evident. And this is what happens with Job. Look at this. Turn, go back two chapters and go to Job chapter 29. Verse, uh, Job chapter 29. Go back to verse, um, we read this earlier, uh, let me see. Verse 7, Job 29, verse 7, he says, When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the public square, this is the place of judging issues, okay? And look at verse 8, The young men, the young men saw me and hid, them, and hid themselves, and the old men arose and stood. Verse 9, The leaders stopped talking and put their hands on their mouths. When they saw Job. Verse 10, The voices of the prominent people were hushed, and their tongues stuck to their palates. Verse eleven. For when an ear heard it, it called. When, for when an ear heard it, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw it, it testified support of me. Right? He wasn't bragging. He was not braggadocious. He was acknowledging, okay, that he had reached a level in his walk with God that people can see this very clearly in his life. Can people do the same in your life? Can they? Now, stay with me there. Job chapter twenty nine. Drop down to verse, um, I had it marked, give me a moment, um, verse 21. Job chapter 29, verse 21, he says, To me they listened and waited, and they kept silent for my advice. 22, verse 22, My words they did not speak again, and my speech dropped on them. Verse 23, They waited for me as for rain, and opened their mouths as for the late rain. Look at verse 24. I smiled at them when they did not believe and they did not look at my kindness ungraciously. Look, the thing that, that, that's really amazing about Job, well, there's so many amazing things about Job, is that Job did not allow his wealth to lead him astray, to lead him away from the Lord. Rather, Job put his wealth to good use and he was faithful, he was generous, and he was just. He was grateful to the Lord for all had been given to him. Okay? He was both a good and steward and a faithful manager of all that God had entrusted into, into his care. Let me ask you, are you, is that a description of you and I? That's what we should aspire to. To, to use everything that God has placed into our lives okay, and use it for his glory. Now, there are two small um, there are two small bits of information okay, given here that, that show how deeply Job was committed to his family and to the Lord. He was a faithful father. He was a faithful, faithful father. Look, first Job, and I want you to look at this in Job chapter 1 verse 4. Okay, Go back there with me. Job chapter 1. First, Job's family was close. It was a close family. A fact that's seen in his children celebrating special occasions together. Each brother took a turn turning, hosting his brother and sisters, okay? They were a close-knit family, okay? Now, I don't come from a close-knit family. I wish they did, but that, that's, that's, not, that's not my case, okay? 
But look at this in Job chapter 1, verse 4. He says, His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send word and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Okay? Now, this one fact here, if I can put it in those terms, this one fact here shows that Job and his wife had reared a loving and tight-knit family, one that cared for one another, and they enjoyed being together. Job's sons were careful to take care of their sisters' well-being and act and, and, and look and act that and act that was necessary in a very male-dominated society of that day. And we still have a very male-dominated society today. Okay, and this is clearly indicated by the presence of all three sisters in each of these special family celebrations. Again, okay? they took care of their family. They were close knit. They watched out for them. And the second thing I want you to know, a little bit of information, is is that Job watched over and cared deeply for his children. How do I know that? Because he consistent he consistently sought the Lord for their cleansing and purification. He and Job understood that his sins had there was more than a possibility they could have sinned. Go, go down to the next verse, Job chapter one verse five. And in Job chapter 1, verse 5, he says, And when the days of the feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send word to them and consecrate them, getting up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings, okay, according to the number of them all. And, then, and he says, For Job said, Perhaps, he understood this, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And Job did so continue. He was constantly praying for them. And in fact, after, after the children's celebration, he would offer a burnt sacrifice for each child. In other words, there was ten sacrifices in all. Job did this in case they had cursed God or sinned in some way during their festivities. He wasn't going to take any chances. He, he understood his children were not perfect. He got that. I wish more of us would get that. You know, people... And people, they're delusional how they look at their children. Job was not delusional how he looked at it. He understood there were human beings with flaws in them. He understood that. He got that, okay? And because of Job's sacrifices, okay, some individuals may be quick to suppose that the children's festivities were immoral or even wicked. And I've heard pastors preach that. But the scripture does not say that the social events were morally wrong or simple. It just doesn't say that. But yet I've heard pastors um, impose that. Okay. Most likely Job simply understood that people can be careless with their thoughts. People can be careless with their words. In fact, people can be careless with their behavior when they're having a good time. His children may not have sinned overtly or purposely, but Job was likely a, was like a was like any other godly father who would be concerned that his children had sinned in their hearts, okay, and that they had failed to conduct themselves like they should righteously. Okay, Job understood this, and he prayed, and he would cry before the Lord, and he would pray, he would cry before the Lord, and he would offer sacrifices on their behalf. So Job took extra protection. He took extra precautions and offered burnt off sacrifices on their behalf. This was the very sa look. This was the this was the very sacrifice that God required to receive forgiveness of sin. A sacrifice that, uh, that pointing to the atoning sacrifice of the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly what Job was doing. Now, think just think about this for a moment. Job presents, okay, a powerful, powerful example of godliness. A clear picture of a man who sought to honor the Lord and all that he did. All that he was, blameless and upright, he was a human being. He was a human. He was a man. My question to you is, do you find yourself in the same kind of perspective, outlook as Job? Or are you blinded to your children? Are you blinded to your wealth? Are you blinded to the blessings that you have received from God? Or are you always, or are you in a state of constant saying, thank you, Lord. Help me. I need you. Forgive my children and intercede for them. 
Is that where you find yourself in the midst of this situation? Are you doing the same as Job? Again, don't compare yourselves with anybody else. Compare yourself with the scriptures. We have a pattern here, a godly pattern, okay, that would do us well to study and pray and intercede and persevere in prayer for our families, okay, and be grateful and recognize naked I was born, naked I will live. He that giveth, okay, and he that could taketh, okay, blessed be the name of the Lord.